Hello, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. My name is Mike Heller, and I'm the Director of Product Management at DataShield. I'll be your host for your webinar. This month's webinar topic is Let's Go Fishing, Fishing Analysis for Quick, Actionable Results. The format of our webinar will consist of a presentation and demonstration by David Norlin, our Director of Security Operations at DataShield, an ADT company. We will conclude our webinar with a short Q&A session. As we go through our content today, please feel free to chat with us uh, in your questions through the Zoom. With that, I'd like to go ahead and interest da introduce Dave. David Norlin is our SOC director and is responsible for Cyber Threat Intelligence Team and the Security Operations Center. Dave began his career in the United States Air Force working as a first-line incident responder and security engineer. Following his military service, he was a network security analyst for the Army Defensive Cyber Operations Division, performing incident response, analysis, and forensics for all Army installations within the continental United States. From there, David took a position at DataShield, working as a senior security analyst specializing in threat hunting and network forensics. After the ADT acquisition of DataShield, David was promoted to Director of Security Operations, where he now leads analyst and threat intelligence teams in the DataShield Security Operations Center. David, with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. The goal of this presentation really is to give something that is uh, quick and meaningful for the end user. Uh, we realize that you could have a, a series of webinars over phishing. It could be a really long and in-depth topic, but that's not what we're trying to do today. This is quick analysis, something that uh, you can do quickly um, as needed to really tell you what's going on. So uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. So phishing in 2020, um, as we all know, phishing has been around for quite a while. Um, it's something that and all, all, all organizations face, um, and it's still the most widespread form of attack, uh, no surprise there. Um, the interesting thing is once you actually get into phishing and the content of a phishing email, very little of it actually contains malware. Now, most of what we see, um, it, it will contain malware. We typically associate it with like um, maybe a bad attachment or a link to a, some kind of download, but Oftentimes, uh, and actually in the vast majority of times, we're seeing it based on scams and social engineering, and that's really the, the dangerous type of emails. Uh, the ones that do include malware or some kind of link, um, the overwhelming tendency now, uh, at least uh, in the past year, in 2019 leading up to now, has been to go after credentials. And those are very useful when you're logging into online services. Everything is you know, as, as a service. So if you can get those credentials, potentially you can reuse them elsewhere, uh, be it Office 365, some other kind of web uh, application, so on and so forth. The problem this creates is that because a lot of the, um, the emails don't contain malware or are maybe based on credentials um, and that kind of thing may be hard to detect, um, we don't have a great way to protect the end user still. We have really secure email gateways um, and, and those are looking for specific kinds of things, but it, let's say you get a phishing email that is literally just some text. Uh, maybe it's a, um, something that's trying to interact with user and, and gets a social engineering attempt going. That's not an easy thing to detect. It's just text. It may even come from a legitimate sender. So there's a lot of pressure on the end user to try to protect themselves and identify something that uh, has gone through the system. So when we look at phishing analysis and if we're trying to do it quickly, you know, we're, we're wanting to capture a few things. We're going to look at the uh, contents of the email, various anomalies that we can see just as uh, by virtue of what, what the email is, you know, weird attachments, weird uh, links, um, unusual phraseology, that kind of thing. And then from a technical level uh, for this, we're going to go over just a few quick things that you can uh, look at, things that are achievable by an end user that it doesn't go too deep into the weeds, but you can still get uh, some, some basic um, IOCs and then kind of confirm your suspicions and, and make a decision from there. So this will be the, uh, the very quick at a glance portion of our analysis. And oftentimes, you know, the first thing you see in an email is the, the text of an email. So 
we're looking at uh, unusual word choices, unusual tone. And, and it's one of those things when you know it when you see it. And we've got a few examples here. These are all from real phishing emails. Um, and we'll just kind of break them down. It's stuff that most people would catch. But, you know, sometimes if you're in the uh, wrong frame of mind, you, you might skim over this and not quite see it. But things like greetings, I have a wonderful news for you. you know, things, these things aren't, uh, this isn't how people talk, right? right? If you're a native speaker, um, these aren't choices that you would, uh, you would make in your email unless, you know, we do live in the age of autocorrect. It's always possible that you might mistype and then it comes out this way. But generally, in a professional environment, you know, these aren't the kind of things that you're going to see. Uh, like finding best peoples for best business, you know, this is clearly some kind of uh, non-native speaker that's trying to compose an email that sounds professional. So that's typically the kind of things we see in, in especially these social engineering emails. Uh, especially like when we get into uh, things that interact with financial organizations, we see this a lot where it tries to come off in a certain way, um, but it falls short in, in, in the wording. Um, things like I recently changed my bank and, and I'll like to update my paychecks details. You know, these aren't things that people say. So I've got a few more examples here and devoting some additional slide uh, slides to this because it is kind of a big aspect of the, uh, social engineering component of phishing. And, and these are just all phishing, all, uh, all from real phishing emails. You can see like it, they quickly get into uh, the realm of being quite unusual. And I'll just read a couple here. Attached, please find important information regarding a recent transaction from your employer sponsored benefits account. Uh, okay, maybe it's possible that you might receive that. T time sensitive information. So now they're trying to create this sense of urgency. Please review immediately. And then, of course, the next line is to open the attachment, use your, a component of your debit card as the password. So that's not something that anybody's going to ask for uh, in a real scenario. And then other things about uh, um, like the transactions between business, businesses that wouldn't have to be explained, like kindly refer to my fax document sent via email because it's very important. You know, all these are trying to create this sense of urgency, wanting to push the user into doing something they might not ordinarily do. Uh, I thought you might like a scanned copy of the article. No one scans copies of articles anymore. And if they do, it's something that maybe you, you knew about or, or there was some kind of prior conversation. There was a reason to scan the copy of the article. Um, uh, this last one is actually kind of, of interesting. I forwarded an application for pre-approval pre on a loan over a week ago, and I'm curious if it made it its way to the bank. Uh, my phone number is such and such. If you need to reach out to me for follow-up to that request and transferring support documentation, this one is actually pretty good. But if you were, uh, let's say you were in the, rhythm of doing this all the time and you were working on these loan pre-approvals and then someone just emailed you, it's almost possible that you would then reach out to that person and say, oh, well, maybe I didn't get the documentation or you know, maybe I'm missing something. So you just have to kind of think logically about what these people are asking. So here we get into addressing anomalies. And um, we didn't pull any examples of this. We obviously don't want to expose a giant batch of email addresses. Um, but I think the idea of this is, is pretty self-explanatory. So if you think about um, when you see emails addressed within an organization, it's usually going to people that you know in the organization. Um, and it's usually all within the same company. You might have a couple different domains. Maybe there's a couple different companies working together. You'll see recipients from, from those two organizations. But a lot of times in these spam campaigns, um, especially the, the lower effort spam campaigns, maybe it's put together by some kind of script kitty or someone that's new to setting up these types of things, we'll just blast it out to a giant chunk of email addresses. And you'll see this huge block of, um, of email addresses that don't seem to be related at all. You'll see like official business emails, um, personal Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, that kind of thing. And it's all just lumped together into this giant uh, two field. So that's a pretty good indication that this is some kind of spam attempt. Um, and just trying to cast that really wide net. And then a lot of times, um, if someone is trying to perform reconnaissance on an organization, they'll also try to send to um, addresses that are probably going to exist in some organizations, um, like HR, accounting, invoicing, uh, ordering, or some kind of generic department name at the, the domain name of that organization. If you start to see those, and you know that those don't necessarily exist, and you can start to ask yourself a question as to, you know, who would send this? Um, what's the content of this email? Why are we getting these? Uh, and these are the kind of things that maybe uh, an analyst would notice um, or uh, an email or uh, email administrator, I guess in the old days, an exchange administrator or 
uh, someone who, who's doing a lot of IT work in, in an organization. So that's the kind of um, suspicious types of activity uh, that you, you could pick up on, even if they didn't actually make it to uh, a real address, you can maybe see if you're, you're being targeted that way. Now, when we get to links, these are things that we do typically associate with phishing, um, especially like the bad kind um, that would, it's not something that is just trying to get a social engineering response out of them, out of a, uh, the target. It's actually trying to get them to click on something to retrieve presumably some kind of document or payload. Um, and, and thankfully we have a couple of ways of, of detecting it. And, um, you know, a lot of times a good secure email way, email gateway will catch this kind of thing. But here you see a lot of randomization in, um, in the email link, if you hover it over it, hover over it in Outlook, you can see it'll give you that preview window, and you can see that a lot of these are just generated seemingly uh, at random. The, the uh, at least the, the text of it, and that's probably because they've set these up. They're all scripted. They're trying to conceal what the uh, actual resources are. They may link back to some kind of document that has uh, some encrypted contents, and then it's looking for a specific value in that URL uh, when it requests it. So. Um, that's a, a pretty strong indicator. A lot of legitimate business emails won't have this really um, convoluted and, and randomized link to them. Um, and then also things that point directly to an IP. So most people, I think in 2020, know what an IP looks like. If you see a URL, it goes directly to an IP. That's pretty unusual uh, nowadays. It's, there's always some kind of reason that that could exist, but generally it's not something that you would normally see. And then also something that points to a file. Um, and maybe it's not a file that you would expect. So if you have, um, if you're expecting to retrieve a document, but it goes to a JPEG, or maybe they're even so bold as to put an executable in there, um, that would be a strong indication that this is probably not what, uh, not what it says it is. And then here is, I think what most people would consider the classic phishing scenario. It's a, it's an attachment, uh, to an email that, maybe doesn't necessarily need an attachment. It doesn't have a lot of context around it. It's just this random attachment that's sent to, uh, sent to a person and, and pres uh, presumably they, they want you to click on it. Um, here you have a, uh, a, a few different examples. So someone has sent the meeting notes, uh, apparently of a document down in the lower left, our meeting dot doc, uh, dear colleague, pre law meeting. Um, so kind of an un unusual, uh, attachment there and a lot of people don't write meeting notes unless there's some kind of reason and you would know beforehand uh, that, that there would be meeting notes for that uh, other times you know the top example um, Jerry has sent an email that looks like some kind of other personnel document uh, going to a um, going to a random recipient you know unrelated things that, that don't seem to connect very very clearly um, and then also uh, in this last example, randomize um, file names to attachments uh, is also a good indication that these have been generated very quickly. It's part of a spam campaign. They're just, you know, naming it to, to get it out the door. So next we wanna get into something that is hopefully useful and actionable, uh, as I mentioned earlier, something that people can quickly reference and use in a real world environment without having to spend too much time. A lot of times in incident response, you wanna make a decision that's informed, but also quickly because you know time may be of essence. So we're gonna talk about a few ways that you can validate that an email is malicious. Uh, again, this is very basic, um, but it's also, again, try, trying to give you the, uh, the tools to, to decide quickly. So before we get too far into it, I, I wanna discuss a few of the frameworks that are out there, uh, a few of the, the mechanisms that we use to detect and identify malicious emails. Um, and th this is all done automatically. So some of these are, are, are quite old, but they've been they've evolved and kind of built on each other over time. And the first one was the sender policy framework. It was just called the SPF. Um, SPF is a way to check and see if a, uh, an IP is approved to send from the domain that it says it's sending from. Um, pretty straightforward. There's a couple different ways you can set it up. You can have what's called a, uh, different alignments. You can have a strict or a soft fail alignment. Uh, and, and those are going to, uh, excuse me, hard and soft fail. Um, and basically if the IP does not fall within the, uh, the approved sender list for a domain, then it will fail almost all the times. 
uh, and then the soft fail is going to let it let it send, but it will uh, create an error. And we'll see what that looks like here in a moment. Next, we have DKIM. DKIM is a, another way. It was kind of a, a more recent way of um, verifying that uh, an email was authorized by the domain owner. And what that means is it's going to be some kind of digital signature that is attached to an email. And this gives you good confidence as the recipient that the, uh, the email is l legitimate. Um, and then it's also uh, hasn't been tampered with in route. So this is good for kind of like um, validating that attachments are real, uh, that the, the sender is real. It's just another means of authentication. And then on top of that, we have DMARC. And DMARC is taking those two um, mechanisms, SPF and DKIM, and then it's kind of creating this reporting and response layer for organizations that receive email. So if you have DMARC enabled, um, if someone were to receive your email and it had an SPF soft fail, so maybe it had come from an IP that wasn't authorized for the SPF configuration, it would, uh, DMARC would tell your, uh, or excuse me, tell the recipient's email gateway how to handle that. Sometimes uh, you may say allow it through or block it or uh, take some other kind of action, but that's, it's really more about the response and reporting. And there's also some authentication and um, some other settings in there that help you um, tailor a response depending on the kind of organization you are or the kind of control you wanna have. And DMARC's really effective. Uh, it's not always implemented uh, fully um, across as many organizations as we would, as we would like, but it's really a, a good standard. So I have created a fairly simplified example of headers. Uh, if you've ever looked at email headers, especially now in the era of like cloud services, um, they are very, very long and convoluted. It's, it's pretty complicated to understand what you're looking at. Uh, it's quite difficult. So it does take some time and it, and it wouldn't even have fit very well on the slide. So I just kind of created some, some basic ones um, to, to give you an idea of what this might look like. And usually you can find these headers, but in the interest of time, uh, here we have a very simplified example. So uh, we can see that we've received an email from pawnee.gov. Um, this is coming from an IP at 185.3.2.1. And in transit, it received this soft fail. Um, and, and the nice thing about SPF is it'll just tell you. Um, the domain uh, in transitioning of this, uh, you know, the sending domain does not designate this IP as a permitted sender. Pretty straightforward, right? So we can see it's going to Leslie, uh, from Ron, uh, subject fill in the pit, and then the date is, of course, you know, the date field. But here we see in the reply to field, uh, the reply to field actually has Ron Swanson at pawnee.ru, which is obviously a different domain than what was sent. So what we can apply here is that um, something unusual is going on. It looks like the sender was legitimate, but uh, if we were to reply to this email, it's not going to go to where it came from. Uh, it's going to go to a different address and we can infer this might be some kind of social engineering attempt just by looking at it but we get a little bit further into the spf record and i've created kind of a fake spf record for this you can see um the spf record is saying include every everything from this domain and then the little tilde all is uh the indication for a soft fail and then uh the actual spf record uh denoted by spf1 saying only IPv4 addresses from this range. So we can clearly see that um, the email was sent potentially on behalf of uh, Pawnee.gov, but it did not come from where uh, the owners of Pawnee.gov say these uh, emails should be coming from, which is again that uh, 100.20.30.0 slash 24. So this is clearly some kind of uh, malicious email. And these are the kind of things that you'd wanna check uh, when you first receive um, malicious email. So SPF checking, it's, it's not everything in phishing analysis. Uh, I've made kind of a big deal about it here because it's, it's a quick place to start. And there's a lot of great tools out there. I've linked one here at the bottom of the slide, dmarcanalyzer.com. That's a Mimecast tool. It's free to use. You can put in uh, a domain and immediately see where the IPs are. Um, that, that domain, if you received an email from that domain, that it should come from in theory. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a good example of what an organization looks like nowadays. They've got, this is us, of course, uh, Data Shield Protect. Um, there's the SPF record. And then if you actually look at a lot of these IPs, you can see that we're using a secure email gateway. This is Mimecast. Uh, and then like a lot of business organizations uh, do have, you know, we've got a soft fail configured. And that's 
really um, to help facilitate uh, the delivery of emails. Um, so business processes don't get interrupted. You know, it's just um, kind of a way to uh, keep the wheels turning without uh, blocking too many emails, I guess. So this is a, uh, a very large and wide ocean of, of analysis that you could potentially dive into. Um, file analysis, you know, people spend sometimes huge chunks of their career learning how to uh, take apart files and, and analyze them and, and really um, get into them at a very low level. Um, a lot of organizations don't have the time or the resources to do that. So there's a lot of ways you can quickly get good results on a malicious email um, by looking at a few of the uh, really high quality file upload utilities. And that's going to be, I prefer these three, the app any run uh, utility. It's a, a really great tool. It kind of shows you the execution uh, in progress, gives you a list of all the, uh, the processes that run that are spawn, uh, network connections, that kind of thing. Hybrid analysis and virus total are going to give you more of the after action report, but still very useful and, and reliable. They're, they're kind of standards in the industry. So you'll quickly return results on, on known malicious attachments. Uh, you'll have a strong idea early on if this is going to be malicious. Uh, and then also if you have the resources and the time, a dedicated VM is great for uh, sandboxing, moving malicious emails into a safe environment where you can open them up, detonate them, and then um, get further indications and IOCs from there. And then as a last resort, we always like to have a dedicated physical machine, whether it's like a, a laptop or uh, some kind of workstation that's connected to a line that, that's not part of your environment. Uh, you know, we, we've called it a dirty line or a commercial line, something that's completely isolated that you don't have to worry about infecting anything if you were to um, start a, a malicious document or execute a, a malicious document. So lastly, uh, we're coming up uh, on the end here, about eight minutes left. Um, we want to talk about how Data Shield detects and responds to phishing. And, and really what we have is kind of a, a multi-pronged approach. So we take a lot of different uh, types of data in. Uh, we're, we're leveraging partnerships with Mimecast and Proofpoint. Uh, and then kind of combining all the indicators we get from that with CTI. Uh, we have a, a pretty well-developed CTI team here that looks for uh, malicious email campaigns, the IOCs related to that. And then we scan um, all of the data we have available to us. Uh, and we're looking for, you know, the main things related to phishing, suspicious IPs, domains, addresses, and then also uh, from like a separate malware level when those things ex execute, whether it's like a malicious document, um, you know, Emotad or, or TrickBot, whatever the case may be, um, we're looking for IOCs there as well. So we're kind of attacking this from a lot of different angles. And, and the main workflow is, you, you know, you identify the fish, you want to know that it's occurred, obviously. And, and uh, you know, that information may come from the scanning, may come from uh, the customer in the event that we have, uh, we don't have um, visibility into all email in an environment. Sometimes uh, a report is great in helping begin an investigation. And then we'll review that, uh, hopefully in a sandbox environment, we'll, we'll pull out the email, we'll uh, do the investigation, extract the IOCs, which is really valuable. And then we'll take that and enrich the data that we do have access to. So we'll do the scanning, we'll integrate it into our CTI, and then uh, we can do continuous monitoring to see if anybody else clicks on it. And some tools we leverage will will tell that for us. And this is an example of, of the Proofpoint dashboard. Uh, it's a great way to quickly identify if a user has been impacted and, and what kind of interaction you've got when you uh, when they receive that email. And you can also see uh, where it's been seen elsewhere. So yeah, Proofpoint gives you that, that really rich integration and uh, it can tell you if this is more of a widespread thing or if it's affecting just your organization. And it'll also try to gauge the severity of it. And this, for an analyst, is, is great information. This is really the enrichment that we like to get uh, from the tools we use because it just speeds the investigation that much quicker. So uh, that's really our, our approach to phishing. It's a, it's a problem that will probably never go away. And we've tried to come up with a lot of different ways to combat it. Uh, not just one solution uh, will, will do the job. So I think that's going to be it for my portion. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat today. So we'll go ahead and wrap this webinar up. Would like to go ahead and call out uh, and you'll be receiving invites for the upcoming webinars, March 3rd, Operationalizing Incident Response, March 17th, Vulnerability Management Review. 
Just a little bit about Data Shield. We were founded in 2009 and we're an ADT company. We are one of the most tenured cybersecurity firms in North America. And DataShield provides end-to-end cybersecurity resilient solutions with a specialty in managed detected, detection and response or MDR services. Uh, please be sure to check out our website at www.datashieldprotect.com and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. And lastly, be sure to listen to our podcast, The Hash Time Show, which can be found on all major podcasting outlets. Again, thanks for joining us. And remember, don't get fished.